Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Howdy, y'all out there tuned in on RLM Radio. This is Grimnir and this is the Grim Leftovers Show. This is episode 20 of 2020. Or uh, show twenty seventy two overall of the Grim Leftovers show. And today is uh, Monday, May 18, 2020. Show 20 of 2020. Wow. Anyway, howdy, hi, and howdy to everybody out there listening in to all the various places you may be tuned in from. Whether that be right here on com or rlmradio.xyz or the tune in place there, uh, Vosscast, realliberty.org. I don't know where all we go. Uh, that, that's, I think that's most of the spots, but uh, we could be being restreamed, and I wouldn't even realize it, wouldn't even know. Yeah, episode 72, Meister Brow, Meister Brow. Uh, so, anyway, welcome to all the folks here in the chat today. I see a bunch of folks over here today. Good folks we got hanging out with us. Vin E., who's. Uh, Apparently in some kind of online education deal. Mr. Meister Brow, the woodman. Uh, Cowboy Tech, and I saw a sock, and there's Java Doctor, and AKA <laughs> Rome's Trust No One. Uh, Cowboy Tech, did I mention him already? I think I did. I miss Kate. Sock Puppet. Uh, Frumpy. Hey, Rumsa. Uh, the Moose Girl. Hey, Moose. Um, who else we got? We got Vanna White, of course, and the Barman, and, and the Weather Dork. And other people tuned in. Those are the ones I see chatting currently live. But we got like 40 people in here. Well, some 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 bots and some people. Mostly people. Hey, Chloe, how you doing? <laughs> oh, I get to walk with the dogs on the show. Woof, woof. <laughs> oh, let's see. Do I have any RLM news for you? Not really. Um, I, I think the RLM's flown along pretty smoothly at this point in time. As far as I can tell, better than some other sites out there. Uh, so yeah, I, I, that, that's going pretty well. Uh, Prince missed his show on Saturday night, which is fine. Uh, he'll do a, he'll do another show this coming Saturday. So uh, the Power Hour, which comes on at 11 p.m. on the Eastern Time on Saturday nights. So look forward to that. Check the schedule over there on Real Liberty Media for all the shows coming up throughout the week. Anyway, I got a bunch of stories. A bunch of stories to cover for you, so I should just go ahead and jump right on into them. Uh, none of these are a surprise. This is the Leftovers show, after all. And so all these stories are a month or so old. Uh, maybe a little more. Maybe a little less. Anyway, you ready? You ready for some news? For some old news? What do you call old news? I mean, it's news would be it's, uh, new. Old. Is this olds? <laughs> All right, Vinny, get you later. Uh, <laughs> don't be calling us perps. We're not perps. Oh. <laughs> All right, checking it off today from the activist post dot com, posted on April eleventh, uh, two thousand twenty, by Sparrow Scoras. WHO official, yeah, that's uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, as Hal would say. Not the rock group, not an owl, the WHO. Yes. It's time to remove people from their homes. And COVID task force admits inflated numbers. So they're lying about the numbers and they want to steal you right out of your homes. Day by day, Bill Gates is revealing himself in his own words as he calls for strict lockdowns, which cannot and must not be lifted until the vast majority of the global population is vaccinated with his poisons and tracking devices. Last week, a top WHO official stated that it's time for a Sorata to come into your home to see who is infected and take them away 
for the greater good, of course. At the same time, a top White House Coronavirus Task Force doctor who has serious conflicts of interest and appears to be on Bill Gates' payroll just admitted the mortality rate of the, the mortality rate of this outbreak is being inflated. How could this be? Take a peek behind the curtain as we explore the latest information on the corporate media uh, that the corporate media is not paid to report on, or is paid not to report on, more accurately. Yes, they're paid not to say any of this stuff. Anyway, there's a video, an interview here um, uh, by Spiro, and, and this, this video uh, interview will be uh, posted into the blog. It'll be embedded right into the blog today for you. Uh, and um, I, I, I think you might, I, I know it's a month old, but you still may want to go ahead and uh, watch that video. Um, it's still good information. Frumpy posts a quote here. I'm not sure who made this quote. Uh, might have been Payne, Thomas Payne, but I'm not sure. Anyway, it says, the tree, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Let's hope there's more of the tyrant blood <laughs> than the patriot blood. Welcome back, lady. Oh, God. Okay. Next up, well, we got a sip of water here first. <laughs> ah, water. Yes. On Zero Heads from April 12th, 2020, by Tyler Durden. Explosive report. You know, it's a we're living in a in a corona world and uh, uh yeah i'm a, i'm a i'm a i'm a corona girl how's that song go <laughs> all right explosive report wuhan biolab captured bats from caves traced to covid-19 outbreak they had us funding <sighs> Recent findings regarding the origin, the origin of COVID-19 continue to support our January reporting, the one that got him kicked off, uh, Zero Hedge, got Zero Hedge kicked off of Twitter, that the disease may have originated from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which was experimenting with a bat coronavirus found to be 96% genetically identical to COVID-19. On Saturday, the Daily Mail added an important piece of the puzzle. The Institute was experimenting on mammals captured over a thousand miles away in Yunnan. I guess that's how you say that, Y-U-N-N-A-N, -N, which is particularly notable because of the genetic analysis of COVID-19's genome has traced it to horseshoe bats found in the Yunnan's caves. Also disturbing is that the lab had been operating in part on a $3.7 million grant from your U.S. government. The Mail on Sunday has learned that scientists have experimented on bats as part of a project funded by the United States uh, U.S. National Institutes of Health, which continues to license the Wuhan library, la laboratory, library? laboratory to receive American money for experiments. Results of the research were published in November 2017 under the heading Discovery of a Rich Gene Pool of Bat SARS-related coronaviruses provides new insights into the origin of SARS coronavirus. Since we're now dealing with SARS coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2, uh, the exercise was summarized as bats in a cave in Yunnan, China, were captured and sampled for coronaviruses used for lab experiments. 
all sampling procedures were performed by veterinarians with approval from the Animal Ethics Committee of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So you got veterinarians doing experiments and studies on these bats, which will then be converted into something human transmissible. Bat samplings were conducted 10 times from April 2011 through October 2015 at different seasons in their natural habitat at a single location, a single cave, in Kunming, Yunnan Province, China. Bats were trapped and fecal swab samples were collected, the paper continues. You know, there, there's so much about this coronavirus stuff that um, deals with fecal matter. Well, what the what 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 the hell is the deal with uh, bats and, and and fecal matter, and and humans in fecal matter, uh, for that matter, that has to do with this virus? What it, it's just like uh, it's a it's a real it's a shitty ass virus. <laughs> in April 2018, a similar study was published by the Institute of Fatal Swine Acute Diarrhea Syndrome caused by HKU2-related coronavirus of bat origin, which reveals, following a 2016 bat-related coronavirus outbreak on Chinese pig farms, bats were captured in a cave and samples were taken. Experimenters grew the virus in the lab and injected it into, a three -day -old, into several three-day-old piglets. Intestinal samples from sick piglets were ground up and fed to other piglets as well. Very sick, very sick stuff that they were doing. According to the Mail, senior ministers can no longer rule out that the virus was first spread to humans after leaking from a Wuhan laboratory. Well, that, of course, was after they made sure that it was human transmissible. That, and leaking is kind of a, a misnomer there. They, they intentionally leaked it, intentionally pushed it out to the public, uh, but uh, they make you say, think by them saying leaking, of that, oh, it got out by accident. We, we didn't intentionally do this. No. Or did they? Or is it possible they never even came up with anything. They just released the information saying, hey, this is what this virus will do. Be afraid. <laughs> All right. Um, there, there's more to the article, should you care to read it. And um, as always, the comments on Zero Edge are entertaining, if not enlightening. <laughs> Uh, this next article basically talks about the same thing. Um, and this was posted a couple days before that one over on Infowars.com by uh, not not by Alex, but by uh, Jabal White. Jabal White is the guy's name that put this up there. Global bombshell: China admits to harvesting and testing COVID-19 like coronaviruses at the Wuhan lab. lab talking about the fact that Obama's National Institute of Health, which that was not in the previous article, Obama's National Institute of Health, uh, paid the Chinese weapons lab $3.7 million to conduct the coronavirus research. Uh, and, and this is also references back to the same uh, Daily Mail article. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and give you the link to this one. Uh, the link will also be in the blog post, but it's really the same information, but... Uh, spelled out in a more info wars style uh, than uh, than it is in uh, uh, zero hedge style. So um, yeah, or not next. What not not next? Next down. Beetle. <laughs> so um, for those of you that are not that are not put off by reading things on uh, info wars, I, I would suggest go ahead and read it. Uh, they're they're good. I, I mean you know. Uh, everything is not crazy Alex doing crazy stuff. 
There's a lot of good information over there on InfoWars, as there has always been. So uh, I would suggest if you got you know a few uh, moments there, and like I said, these links are like I said all all in the post show blog. All the uh, Moose Girl, Moose Girl, you tuned in. All right. Well, not just for Moose Girl. This may apply to other folks out there as well. But uh, if you're having uh, financial difficulties at this point in time, uh, due to whatever factor, it may be because you got laid off uh, by somebody because the government shut down your business. And people like to say, because of the coronavirus, my business shut down. No, 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 no. Your business didn't shut down because of coronavirus. Your business shut down because the government forced them to. <laughs> Which in all the previous pandemics and epidemics and all kinds of stuff, bad stuff happening, natural disasters, whatever, businesses were not shut down. But this time, people are saying, because of coronavirus, my business, no! <laughs> All right, so anyway, if you're having a little difficulty uh, with cash flow out there, and you, you need some extra money in a hurry, I suppose, this might be something you might consider. Uh, uh, more, than, more than one in three Americans consider selling blood. As lockdowns continue, yep. <laughs> well, and this, uh, like I said, from, from over a month ago, uh, where only only 17 million Americans were out of work. Now it's what 35 million. Anyway, with 17 million Ameri Amer 17 million Americans out of work in under three weeks, consumer sentiment crashing the fastest on record, and the economy sliding into a deep dark hole, a depression, households are starting to crack. The evidence of the working poor crushed by the economic downturn is starting to be realized with huge runs on the food bank systems across the country. On Thursday alone in the, at the San Antonio Food Bank, located in San Antonio, Texas, um, <laughs> about 10,000 households uh, got food from, from the food bank. Does it remind you of the Great Depression? Well, of what you've probably read about the Great Depression, because I don't think anybody here has been, actually been through or went through the Great Depression. I don't know how old my oldest listeners are, but uh, it's possible. Maybe. You'd have to be like 90. <laughs> to confirm our thoughts that the evolution of the virus, uh, virus crisis has morphed into a financial crisis and now a social crisis, we turn to a recently published study via the career advice site Zeta, Zeti, Z-E-T-Y dot com. And they have confirmed what we have been saying for years. Households do not have the financial cushion to weather an economic storm. The study polled around a 1,000 working Americans last month, asking them about their financial well-being. In the first series of questions, respondents were asked about how long their savings could bridge them if they lost their jobs. Shockingly, 36% answered zero to one month. Zero to one month. We're well over one month of lockdown at this point. 24 answered, and many of these 24% fall somewhere in this category of one to three months and so forth. But we're rapidly approaching the three month mark, so yeah. That means the, at least 60% of respondents had only enough savings for less than three months. And judging by today's lockdowns, we could extrapolate those numbers and conclude that many people, it says might, but I'm going to go with will, will not survive the economic downturn currently underway despite the current UBI checks. I guess that's, I don't know what that means. Some kind of corona stimulus checks. UBI checks. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, with financial conditions of households, 
quickly deteriorating, their savings are limited, uh, having unsurmountable debts that mounting expenses could force some into liquidating assets to build cash. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm selling stuff on eBay. The survey had this to say. Women were more likely than men to sell certain items for extra money, including their clothing and shoes, 57%, jewelry, 41%. In contrast, men were slightly more willing to part with their laptop. Holy hell, guys! You're going to sell your computer? That's your source of income. Anyway, <laughs> collectibles, 36%. Blood plasma, 36%. 36% selling blood plasma, the ban. Cars, 23%, and sports equipment, 22%. Get rid of that sports equipment. Just get rid of it. Collectibles, get rid of it. Who needs it? Jewelry? Pah! What the hell? <laughs> You're going to need your car. You're going to need your laptop. Blood plasma replenishes itself, so... But uh, you're not going to get a bunch for it either. Um, <laughs> anyway, they got a chart here breaking all this down. But you read it correctly. More than one-third of Americans, uh, let me see if it says women. Yeah, 35% of women, 36% of men uh, are willing to sell blood plasma. Your blood to pay your bills. Yeah, more than a third of Americans who are in financial binds will are willing to sell their blood to make a few extra dollars to cover rent payments, service bills, and maybe even use the money to cover student loan payments. Screw those student loans! However, the government has unveiled a new economic hardship deferment plans for working class poor that could alleviate some of the short-term stress. As calls for blood plasma donations are increasing due to the pandemic, search term for blood plasma has hit a new record high. Maybe the working class poor can sell their blood for cash to put food on their tables. So, so when you sit down to the uh, the table and you're, you're and you're saying grace there with your children, you say thanks for letting me have blood to sell so my kids can eat. Oh, my God. <sighs> I don't know what to say. I, I mean, I don't know I don't know how much you get for a, a pint of blood plasma or whatever it is, but it ain't much. I mean, that, that ain't going to take you far. Uh, maybe it'll pay, like, your uh, water bill or something, but I don't, and I don't know how often you could sell blood plasma. But I think it's like a month or something like that. I don't think it's many more often than that, but find something else. I, I don't know. I don't know. Twice a month, says Rob. Okay, thanks, Rob. All right. And an oddly interesting website. I mean, to me, it seems odd and interesting that this article would be posted up there. But it was posted up there on March 20th. Um, the, the website is techstartups.com. Okay. Breaking at that point, new evidence shows the CDC known has known since at least 2005, 15 years ago, that chloroquine or chloroquine, how do you say that word, is effective against coronaviruses. Yeah. Since for 15 years, they've known. We've been covering coronavirus outbreaks since January, after the deadly coronavirus started to make headlines here in the good old U.S. of A. Since the virus is still new to the United States, we spent some time learning more about the virus from two major authoritative, authorita health organizations, the WHO and the CDC. And uh, you know my opinion on both of those organizations. They are not out there for your good. They are not there to protect people. They are evil. <laughs> anyway, as it turns out, coronavirus ain't new. Hell, it's been around for a long time. There are seven types of coronaviruses. 
As WHO explains on its website, coronavirus, COV, are a large family of viruses that cause illness ranging from the common cold to the more severe diseases such as Mideast Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, COV, and Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, SARS, COV. A novel or novel coronavirus and COV is a new strain that has not previously been identified in humans. In other words, the common cold is caused by a coronavirus. Human coronaviruses, which are named for the crown-like spikes on their surfaces, were first identified in the mid-60s, according to the information from the CDC. Uh, they list seven types of coronaviruses here. You don't need to hear them. It's just a bunch of numbers and letters. According to the CDC, people around the world commonly get infected with hu human coronavirus 229E, uh, the alpha coronavirus, NL63, another alpha, OC43, a beta, and HKU1, another beta coronavirus. Sometimes coronaviruses that infect animals can evolve and make people sick and become a new human coronavirus, uh, which is the, the three recent ones, the MERS, the SARS, and the, the COVID-19. Uh, the coronavirus treatment. When coronavirus pandemic claiming over 10,000 lives with at least 250,000 reported cases, again, this is March 20, uh, the race to find treatment for people already infected with coronavirus became critical. The good news came on March 16th with a new academic uh, study by a group of researchers uh, in consultation with Stanford University School of Medicine, UAB School of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences researchers found that over-the-counter, over-the-counter anti-malaria pills, chloroquine, uh, may be highly effective at treating coronavirus COVID-19. Chloroquine, I guess it's chloroquine, uh, works by enabling the body's cells better to absorb zinc. Zinc is the key, which is the key in preventing the RNA transcription and disrupting the often fatal psych cytokine storm. Um, by the way, I got some recently some uh, zinc from um, NutriChamps. It's a liquid. It comes in a, like an eyedropper thing. And um, I forget how much it was, like $15 or something. Uh, it, it, like a 30-day supply uh, of this zinc. I, I always, I've been taking zinc caplets, tablets for a long time anyway. But I, I got this stuff because they came up with a special deal that, that I could get that. and they get some, Anyway, um, highly effective, highly absorbable zinc, um, NutriChamps. Uh, if you go on Amazon, just search NutriChamp zinc. You'll find it. And, um, and you, you may want to get some of that. Zinc, zinc is great stuff for you. Anyway, the study published in Virology Journal titled Chloroquine, a Potent Inhibitor of SARS Coronavirus, infection and spread, found that chloroquine is a relatively safe, effective, and very cheap drug used for treating many human diseases, including malaria, ambiosis, and human immunodeficiency virus, which I guess that's HIV, is effective in inhibiting the infection and spread of SARS-CoV in cell culture. The fact that the drug has significant inhibitory antiviral effect when the susceptible cells were treated either prior to or after infection suggests a possible prophylactic and therapeutic use. Uh, they give you a background, they give you results, but the conclusion is this. Chloroquine is effective in preventing the spread of SARS-CoV in cell culture. Favorable inhibition of virus spread was observed when cells were either treated with chloroquine prior to or after SARS-CoV infection. In addition, the indirect immunofluorescence uh, assay described herein presents a simple and rapid method for screening 
SARS-CoV antiviral compounds. Since SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19, belong to the same family of the virus, it shouldn't come as any surprise that chloroquine is effective against both viruses. In addition, COVID-19 is 95% identical to SARS-CoV, so the question is, if the CDC and the FDA have been aware of the efficacy of chloroquine in treating coronavirus since 2005, why hasn't the FDA collaborated with other organizations and fast-tracked the use of chloroquine and its six sister drug, hydroxychloroquine, and safe, uh, save thousands of lives? And why hasn't chloroquine been mass-produced and made available sooner? Here is what Twitter user Ian Wilson said. Given that the CDC knows chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, is an effective treatment for COVID-19 and a prophylactic against infection, there are grounds for everyone that has suffered and the families of those who have died for a class action lawsuit against the CDC. Yes, frumpy dollars, big, huge, monstrous dollars. Easy peasy, says uh, Rob Works. Yeah, hey, there, Lone Frog, how you doing? Um, so uh, share that with with the skeptics that are out there. Um, again, uh, you know, Nutri Champs on Amazon uh, for for uh, zinc, and you'll find it. It's it's it's, it's good stuff. It's really good stuff. Uh, and like I said, highly highly uh, absorbable. And uh, with that in in your system, you're protected. It's it's a prophylactic, as he said. I mean, if you haven't got it yet, and if you have got it, uh, then, then it's then it it stops it. So, yeah, well, whatever. All right. <laughs> this next article goes a little bit sideways um, on on all this corona nonsense, which is good because we need to go a little sideways. We, we need to tack off a little uh, to one side. We're, we're, we're trying to go up against the wind here. And this is posted on the uh, W W U W T. What's up with that, or what's up with that, because it's W-A-T-T-S. <laughs> what's up with that, uh, dot com. More than 400 news outlets partner with a project seeking media to beef up climate coverage amid pandemic. <laughs> this was posted on April 16th, uh, and, and they, they actually pull it from the Daily Caller, uh, but that's all right. Um, it's uh, the tech reporter from the Daily call, Caller, Chris Wright, that wrote this thing. So, um, a project co-founded by the Columbia Journalism Review is asking hundreds of news outlets to focus their reporting on climate change on Earth Day, as journalists focus on the focus primarily on Corona. Uh, the, the journalist heading the effort believes the media should be devoting the same level of tension to global warming as they do the virus, which has killed more than 100,000 people. Yeah, well, that's debatable, too. Um, energy analysts and critics told the Daily Caller News Foundation that the project's founders are disconnected from reality. Disconnected from reality. And are focusing on vague problems while Americans are trying to stay alive and keep their jobs. <laughs> exactly, Rob. Rob says, uh, need a break from freaking about the virus? Freaking out about the virus? Freak out about the climate instead! Woohoo! <laughs> Hundreds of media outlets, including Reuters, are partner partnering with a project seeking to devote a week of coverage to climate change amid a pandemic that has killed more than 140,000 people worldwide. The founders behind Covering Climate Now 
are asking their network of more than 400 media outlets to blanket the airwaves with stories about climate change during the week of Earth Day. Reuters, Bloomberg News, and the Daily Beast are among the biggest names listed as partners of the project. Covering Climate Now, founded last year, announced the event on February 5th before local and state governments began mitigation efforts to halt the spread of the pandemic. One of the project's founding groups, the Columbia Journalism Review, represents professional journalists, whatever that means, and focuses primarily on journalism ethics. Well, if journalism had the ethics, they wouldn't be reporting on either of these topics. Anyway, I, I don't really have anything to say about that. I mean, the article goes on and on. But I, all I had to point out that was just just go ahead and layer the earth ending <laughs> the end of days things that they come up with just layer them on one after the other one right where well, i'm waiting for the meteor where's my damn meteor that's what i want to know <laughs> Well, when you say, when we got a meteor coming and it's got to smash into the earth and it's big enough to do some serious damage, I'll believe you at that point and not before. Because the rest of this stuff, I mean, come on. Come on! <laughs> so, I, I know there's a lot of people that complain about Twitter and Twitter's censorship and how Twitter... Uh, reports information back to the government and all of that. Well, there's a reason they do it. It's because they're huge and because they get massive pressure from the government to do exactly that. Exactly. You don't like Twitter? Don't use it. Uh, but uh, here's the thing. Twitter wanted to be more open. They wanted to be more honest. They wanted to tell you certain things, but they are not allowed to. This article, posted on Reuters.com on uh, April 18, U.S. judge blocks Twitter's bid to reveal government surveillance requests. You got that, right? Twitter wanted to reveal surveillance requests coming from the government towards you, and the government said, no! Twitter, Inc. will not be able to reveal surveillance requests it's received from the U.S. government after a federal judge accepted government arguments. The government accepted government arguments. Got that? Uh, <laughs> that this was likely to harm national security. Really? <laughs> so you're out there tweeting whatever, and the government wants to put a tap on whatever it is you're tweeting. And if Twitter tells you that government's putting a tap on what you're tweeting, you they are harming national security. <laughs> so they've been trying to do that for six years. For six years, they've been trying and have failed to to let you know when the government is trying to you know investigate you via your tweets which what are they investigating via a tweet <laughs> i don't get it anyway the social media company had sued the department of justice in 2014 to be allowed allowed to reveal, as part of its draft transparency report, the surveillance request it received. It argued its free speech rights were being violated by not being allowed to reveal the details. U.S. District Judge Yvonne Gonzalez Rogers granted the government's request to dismiss Twitter's lawsuit in an 11-page order filed in the U.S. District Court for Northern California. The judge ruled on Friday of that week that granting Twitter's request would likely lead to a grave or imminent harm 
to national to the national security grave or imminent harm to national security by Twitter letting a tweeter know that uh, that the government was looking at their tweets huh <laughs> The government's motion for summary judgment is granted, and Twitter's motion for summary judgment is denied, the judge said in her order. Grave or imminent harm. <sighs> Twitter had sued the Justice Department in its battle with federal agencies as the Internet industry's self-described champion of free speech seeking the right to reveal the extent of U.S. government surveillance. The lawsuit had followed months of fruitless negotiations with the government and had marked an escalation uh, in the Internet industry's battle over government gag orders on the nature and number of requests for private user information. Tech companies were seeking to clarify their relationship with U.S. law enforcement and spying agencies in the wake of revelations by Ed Snowden. Ed Snowden said, hey, this is happening. And the tech company said, whoa, we didn't know that was going on. We got to put an end to this stuff. But no, no, that would be grave or imminent harm to the national security. <laughs> Oh, it could not get any more absurd and bizarre if you... Uh, nothing you can imagine is more wild than this kind of stuff. Well, you know, they're talking now. They're talking now. They're in in the works is a, a plan for a brand new stimulus check. Although, I never got my other stimulus check that was supposed to come my way. Never did. Uh, so whatever, but they're talking about doing another one, a new arm of the stimulus checks. But this article is from the first uh, whatever of the stimulus checks. This was posted on April 15th, which was uh, formerly the, the day formerly known as tax day. <laughs> the artist formerly known as tax day. Okay, on the New York Post, April 15th. Hannah Frischberg. Stimulus checks are being spent on dildos, tigers, guns, and stripper poles. Now, I may have covered this over there on the Freaker's Ball before and just forgot to remove it from my list, but I still find it interesting and funny. So here you go. And I, I say to those stimulus people, stimulus check receivers that can afford to waste their check on nonsensical stuff, get on out there! <laughs> Americans began receiving the first batch of coronavirus relief funds this week, and now many are taking to social media to brag about the assortment of purchases, both strange and savvy. They've already made with those checks. Many are using emergency cash to pay bills. Well, that makes sense for necessities and living expenses. Others are putting the money towards wild splurges. Among the more trivial items people have reportedly used the extra bucks on is inflatable dinosaur costume. Although the buyer argues the $35 get-up was totally worth it. I actually have a good use for it. Plus, Look at the price. I should have bought two, the proud dino seat suit owner tweets. Uh, fuck it. I'm buying a stripper pole with my stimulus check. We have, we have to invest in our future, tweets a future, uh, a future exotic dancer. <laughs> Some are jokingly planning to team up so they can use their economic impact payments to buy a baby tiger. Hear me out. Who wants to combine their stimulus checks with me? And we can buy a tiger, writes one likely fan of Tiger King. 
It's hard to argue that the canopy bed is ever an essential item, but one mom bought a princess-themed bed for her kid. The same argument goes for a woman who used her check to buy a high-end sex toy. Well, that is an essential item, I'm pretty sure. Although she concedes that she bought the stimulator only after paying off a credit card. <laughs> stimulator. Uh, stimulator from a stimulus. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, Donna says uh, she got new toys and tools. That's good. That's good. Moose Girl spent her stimulus on necessities while thinking that it would be getting unemployment. No worries, Moose Girl. You can sell your blood. And if you missed that story, uh, you'll have to go back and check out the uh, the podcast and the blog, uh, the, the link in the blog, where you can go and sell your blood. What? Yes, that's right. <laughs> One hobbyist burning through their stimulus check indulged in paintball equipment, while another caved and bought a pricey pair of Yeezy shoes. I don't know what that is, Yeezy shoes. At least one entire stimulus check and possibly additional cash went towards buying a Bird One e-scooter, which retails for $1,299. Others are considering purchasing personalized insight from celebrities. You purchase personalized insight from a celebrity? Whatever. Thinking about buying myself a cameo from Big Ed? Whoever that is. Um, another che early check recipient spent her cash on warm and cozy coat, which, while arguably out uh, and essential, might be a little out of season. <laughs> All right. Enough of that nonsense. There's plenty more examples here in the article, should you care to peruse it later. Oh, Kanye West design shoes. All right, Moose. But if you got blood, you can sell your blood. Twice a month, apparently. <laughs> oh boy! Now we get now we get to the real the real important article of the day. The real important article of the day, April fourteenth, before it's news. dot com, and Morgan eleven. And again, I may have previously shared this with you. I don't know. I share a lot of articles on this substance uh, because it does so many things. It's just amazing. But it is the real important article of the day. 11 unexpected ways a pinch of baking soda can change your life. Change your life. We're not fucking around here. <laughs> baking soda is an amazing and versatile, versatile substance which can be used to remove stains, keep your sneakers smelling fresh, and even get rid of your sweet tooth. Everyone uses baking soda in everyday life, but many of its benefits remain a mystery. Baking soda isn't only good for cooking, although if you need it, it's indispensable. It actually provides numerous healthy properties that can take care of the organism uh, ideally. Baking soda is completely composed of sodium bicarbonate. This compound can be used in the culinary field, helping the dough to rise and enriching other dishes in flavor and texture. Baking soda has been used to make bread for centuries back and is still used for that purpose today. By the way, it's also good in your pizza doughs. Pizza doughs. Natural. Naturally, baking soda is known as nacolite, N-A-H-C-O-L-I-T-E, nacolite, a derivative of the mineral natron. In Egypt, people used natron for cleaning their households. Then, in 1846, Dr. Austin Church and John Dwight began the process of creating baking soda that is still used today. So prior to 1846, they didn't have this wonderful substance. However, it was not until the 1920s that baking soda was first used, used as a medical means. Baking soda is extremely cheap and available in all stores. 
It is often used to heal accidents and injuries, but it found a place in other cosmetic products as well. Store deodorants can contain plenty of parabens and aluminum. If you want to avoid those heavy compounds, baking soda is the key. By solely brushing the baking soda under the arms and on the feet, or any other stinky areas you might have, um, <laughs> you'll get rid of the unpleasant smell of a sweat. Insect bites and poison ivy. Preparing a baking soda in water paste, apply it directly to the insect bites to stop the itching. Baking soda can also help with treating poison ivy, rashes, and other itches. Baking soda is very powerful when it comes to treating uh, stomach acid, heartburn, indigestion, and even ulcer pain. The ideal recipe, uh, they say, is to mix a half a teaspoon of baking soda and a half a glass of water. I say double that, a full teaspoon of baking soda and a full glass of water. This uh, Take this every two hours. I only take mine in the morning, but be mindful if you are over 60, this might be a huge dose for you. I'm not quite over 60. Getting awful close. A foot soak and exfoliator. Mix three tablespoons of baking soda with warm water and soak your feet in it. Also, you can prepare a paste and scrub the feet with it. It's also beneficial to use this method to cleanse the skin without any side effects. Relaxing soak. Combine baking soda with apple cider vinegar and you get an amazing soak in bath. Afterward, you can leave a little bit more to clean the bathtub as well. Hand cleanser. Now everybody's worried about, where's my hand sanitizer? Don't you worry. You got it. You got baking soda in your house? You got it covered. Combine three parts baking soda with one part water and use this to clean your hands from dirt and unpleasant smells and germs. Uh, splinter removal. Uh, they tell you how to do that here. Sunburn treatment. They tell you how to do that here. Enhanced sport performance. Oh, yeah, I definitely read this on Freakers or somewhere else. Tooth and gum paste. It makes an excellent toothpaste. Just get some uh, mint uh, oil to put in there with it. It's terrific, terrific. And they also uh, say use some sea salt. So I've never, I've never used the sea salt part. Teeth whitener. Yeah, just so many, so many uses. It's such great stuff. Baking soda for the win. <laughs> All right. So I, you know, I just I, I needed to share that again because, uh, yeah, yeah, it's terrific. Now another substance, another substance that Moose Girl has talked about quite often. I have not really talked about it, but maybe I should think about it. I mean, my yard is flooded with dandelions. So many dandelions, it's amazing. <laughs> Growing in my little yard. Uh, but this is how to make dandelion infused oil. April 12th on naturalblaze.com by Tess Pennington. Dandelions are popping up in yards across America. And while some believe this to be an invasive weed, it is a powerhouse in the homesteading world. The dandelion is a perennial, and it contains a wealth of vitamins and nutrients as well as naturopathic applications that are astounding. The dandelion is edible in its entirety, which is really good to know from a survival perspective. They also grow up, uh, upon a taproot, uh, an important consideration as they will grow back if harvested from the surface and the root is left alone. These unassuming blossoms can be used as a remedy for a number of different ailments, as well as for food. From a health standpoint, dandelion greens are chock full of vitamins A, B, C, and D, as well as minerals such as iron, potassium, and zinc in its raw form, and is a good source of calcium and potassium. The young leaves can be harvested and added to salads and stir-fry dishes, as well 
dandelion roots can be gathered, dried, and ground up to make coffee type thing or tea. To make this coffee alternative, the roots of the young dandelion plants are harvested and roasted to a dark brown color. Then make your coffee as you normally do. Um, another medicinal use for dandelions are its leaves. It has been shown that dandelion leaves can help your kidney function. Most scientific studies of dandelions have been in animals, not people. Traditionally, dandelion has been used as a diuretic to increase your amount of urine and eliminate fluid in your body. It helps your, your blood, your liver tonic. Uh, it goes on and on. Um, five helpful tips for successful oil infusion. And then they get down to the dandelion infused oil, how you make it. You need a pint jar with a lid, three to four cups of dandelion blossoms uh, be, before they turn into those white thingies, and, and uh, olive oil. I imagine you could use other oil besides olive oil. Anyway, the the, uh, the process is, is listed in here. The uses are listed in here. Um, so if you've got tons of dandelions growing in your yard, which if you got one, you probably got a bunch more, um, instead of just chopping them all down, you may want to consider making yourself a little bit of dandelion-infused oil or for any of these other purposes that they list. So, baking soda, dandelions. Those are your health tips for... Oh, and zinc. <laughs> These are your health tips for today. Uh, uh, and, and live well. Live good. Uh, be happy. And this stuff is cheap compared to all the nasty crap with all the side effects you might be getting from your uh, medical industrial complex doctors, pharmacists, whoever. This guy, this guy, <laughs> this guy, on the New York Post, posted April 20th <laughs> by Yaron Steinbach. This guy, <laughs> Indian man, that means a man from India, not, not like a Cherokee or nothing. Indian man chops off tongue in sacrifice to stop coronavirus spread. Hi, J-Bug. <laughs> so this guy, a 24-year-old stonecutter in India, chopped off his tongue in an apparent attempt to appease a goddess. How, uh, wouldn't that goddess prefer you with a tongue? What kind of goddess was this? Anyway, uh, to appease the goddess and stop the spread of coronavirus. Most of the goddesses I've known w w would prefer me to, uh, well, they enjoy the tongue. <laughs> Vivek Sharma, who worked with his uh, brother Shivam and seven other brothers at the Bavahan Matma Temple in Sugam, became, became alarmed about the deadly disease, according to the Times of India. His co-worker, Brajesh Singh Saab Singh, Singh twice in your name, really? Brajesh Singh Saab Singh told authorities that Sharma, a devotee of, of the Kali Mata, had kept chanting the deity's name. On Saturday morning, Sharma said he was going to the market, but did not return to the temple. When his brother called him, a person answered and told him that Sharma had sliced off his tongue at the Nawashardi Temple in Gujarat. Uh, the young man was rushed to the hospital in Sarad, where doctors worked to reattach his tongue, uh, which was found in his hand as he lay unconscious on Sunday. For the last few days, he, <laughs> he was keen to go back to his native town, but was impossible due to the lockdown. The goddess was not pleased. The goddess was not pleased. <laughs> All right. All right, folks. I'll wrap it up for the Grim Leftovers show uh, here today. Um, I I've had a good time sharing this weird-ass news with y'all. Uh, you know, don't worry about any of this corona stuff. 
if you're if assuming you're a fine and healthy person, and I mean that physically, mentally, and emotionally, uh, because all of these things matter. I generally I tell you, and I'm going to continue to tell you, stay away from people. People are just dirty, filthy things. Not that you're going to catch any coronavirus, but just you're better off in your own little world, personally. that's That's been my scheme for many years, 20 years. Uh, anyway, <laughs> oh, check the schedule on reallibertymedia.com for all the rest of the shows on RLM Radio throughout the week. If you want to do a show, let me know, and we'll try and get you going there. All right, thanks so much. Talk to you all later. Peace.